Fireside Tales with Wolfgang. Episode 22. Originally broadcast on GWC Productions' YouTube channel, CAPS Media Television Channel 6, KPPQLP Ventura at 104.1 FM, and on the KPPQ Podcast Network. Greetings and salutations. I'm Hunter Ackerman, here to read some classic literature for you and my beastly feline companion, Wolfgang. So, Wolfus, what do you want to hear? And welcome to part two of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's The Red-Headed League. Why should I go armed? I had the hint from Holmes that this smooth-faced pawnbroker's assistant was a formidable man, a man who might play a deep game. I tried to puzzle it out, but decided to set the matter aside until tonight should bring an explanation. It was a quarter past nine when I started from home and made my way across the park to Baker Street. Two carriages were standing at the door, and as I entered, I heard the sound of voices from above. On entering his room, I found Holmes in animated conversation with two men, one of whom I recognized as Peter Jones, the official police agent, while the other was a long, thin, sad-faced man with a very shiny hat and oppressively respectable frock coat. Ha! Our party is complete, said Holmes, buttoning up his jacket and taking his hunting crop from the rack. Watson, I think you know Mr. Jones of Scotland Yard. Let me introduce you to Mr. Merriweather, who is also to be our companion in tonight's adventure. Oh... I hope wild goose chase may not prove to be the end of our chase, observed Mr. Merriweather gloomily. You may place considerable confidence in Mr. Holmes, sir, said Mr. Police Agent Jones loftily. He has his own little methods, but he has the makings of a detective in him. He has been more often correct than our official police force. I think you will find, said Sherlock Holmes, that you will play for a higher stake tonight than you have ever done yet, Mr. Merriweather, and that the play will be more exciting. For you, the stake will be of some... 30,000 pounds. And for you, Jones, it will be the man upon whom... You wish to lay your hands. John Clay, the murderer, thief, and forager. He's a young man, Mr. Merriweather, but he's at the head of his profession, and I would rather have my bracelets on him than on any criminal in London. He's a remarkable man, this young John Clay. His grandfather was a royal duke, and he himself has been to Eton and to Oxford. His brain is as cunning as his fingers, and though we meet signs of him at every turn, we never know where to find the man himself. He'll crack a safe in Scotland one week and be raising money to build an orphanage in Cornwall the next. I've been on his track for years and have never set eyes on him yet. I hope... And I may have the pleasure of introducing you tonight. I've had one or two little turns also with Mr. John Clay, and I agree with you that he is at the head of his profession. It is past ten, however, and quite time we started. If the two of you will take the first carriage, Watson and I will follow in the second. Sherlock Holmes was not very communicative during the long drive, and lay back in the cab, humming the tunes which he had heard in the afternoon. We rattled through an endless labyrinth of gas-lit streets until we emerged onto Farringdon Street. "'We are close there now,' my friend Holmes remarked. "'This fellow Merriweather has a 
bank director and personally interested in the matter. I thought it well to have Jones with us also. He's not a bad fellow, though an absolute imbecile in his own profession. He has one positive virtue. He's as brave as a bulldog and tenacious as a lobster when he gets his claws upon anyone. Ah, here we are. And they are waiting for us. We had reached the same crowded thoroughfare in which we had found ourselves in the morning. Our cabs were dismissed, and following the guidance of Mr. Merriweather, we passed down a narrow passage and through a side door, which he opened for us. Within, there was a small corridor, which ended in a very massive iron gate. This was also opened, and led down a flight of winding stone steps, which terminated at another formidable gate. Mr. Merriweather stopped to light a lantern, and conducted us down a dark, earth-smelling passage. And so, on we went, into a huge vault or cellar, which was piled all round with crates and massive boxes. You are not very vulnerable from above, Holmes remarked, as he held up the lantern and gazed about him. Nor from below, said Mr. Merriweather, striking his stick upon the flags which lined the floor. <clears throat> Why, dear me, it sounds quite hollow, he remarked, looking up in surprise. I really must ask you to be a little more quiet, said Holmes severely. You have already imperiled the whole success of our expedition. Might I beg that you would have the goodness to sit down upon one of those boxes and not to interfere, sir? The solemn Mr. Merriweather perched himself upon a crate with a very injured expression upon his face. Holmes knelt down upon the floor and, with the lantern and a magnifying lens, began to examine minutely the cracks between the stones. A few seconds sufficed to satisfy him, for he sprang to his feet again and put his glass in his pocket. We have at least an hour before us, he remarked, for they can hardly do anything until the good pawnbroker is safely in bed. Then they will not lose a minute, for the sooner they do their work, the longer time they will have for their escape. We are, at present, Doctor, as you have no doubt divined, in the cellar of the city branch of one of the principal London banks. Mr. Merriweather is the chairman of the directors, and he will explain to you that there are reasons why the more daring criminals of London should take a considerable interest in this cellar at present. It is our French gold, whispered the director. We have had several warnings that an attempt might be made upon it. Your French gold? Yes, we had occasion some months ago to strengthen our resources and borrowed for that purpose. Thirty thousand Napoleons from the Bank of France. It has become known that we have never had occasion to unpack the money and that it is still lying in our cellar. The crate upon which I sit contains 2,000 Napoleons packed between layers of lead foil. Our reserve of gold bullion is much larger at present than it usually is kept in a single branch office, and the directors have had misgivings on the subject which were very well justified, observed Holmes. And now it is time that we arranged our little plans. I expect that within, within an hour, matters will come to a head. In the meantime, Mr. Merriweather, we must put the screen over that dark lantern. 
and sit in the dark? I'm afraid so. I had brought a pack of cards in my pocket, but I see that the enemy's preparations have gone so far that we cannot risk the presence of a light. And, first of all, we must choose our positions. These are daring men. And though we shall take them at a disadvantage, they may do us some harm unless we are careful. I shall stand behind this crate, and you conceal yourselves behind those. When I flash a light upon them, close in swiftly. If they fire, Watson, have no compunction about shooting them down. I placed my revolver cocked on top of the wooden case behind which I crouched. Holmes shot the slide across the front of his lantern, and it lifted us in pitch blackness. Such an absolute darkness as I have never before experienced. They have but one retreat, whispered Holmes. It is back through the house in saxe coburg Square. I hope that you have done what I asked you, Jones. I, I've got an inspector and two officers waiting at the front door. Then we have stopped all the holes. Now... We must be silent and wait. From comparing notes afterward, it was but an hour and a quarter, yet it appeared to me that the night must have almost finished and the dawn should be breaking above us. Suddenly, my eyes caught the glint of a light. Then it lengthened out until it became a yellow line, and from the opening, a hand appeared. A white, almost womanly hand, which felt about in the little area of light. Then it was withdrawn as suddenly as it had appeared, and all was dark again, save the single lurid spark which marked a chink between the stones. Its disappearance, however, was but momentary. With a rending, tearing sound, one of the broad white stones turned over upon its side and left a bright, gaping hole through which streamed the light of a lantern. Over the edge there peeped a clean-cut, boyish face which looked keenly about and then, with a hand on either side of the aperture, drew itself shoulder-high and waist-high until one knee rested upon the edge. In another instant, he stood at the side of the hole and was hauling after him a companion, lithe and small, like himself, with a pale face and a head of very red hair. Right, it's all clear, he whispered. Have you the chisel and the bags? Oh, great, Scott, jump, Archie, jump, and I'll swing for it. Sherlock Holmes had sprung out and seized the intruder by the collar. The other dived down the hole, and I heard the sound of rending cloth as police agent Jones clutched at the runner's jacket. The light flashed upon the barrel of a revolver, but Holmes' hunting crop came down upon the man's wrist, and the, pince, the pistol clinked upon the stone floor. "'It is no use, John Clay!' said Holmes, with very little emotion. You have no chance at all. So I see, the other answered with the utmost coolness. I fancy that my pal is all right, though I see you have got his coattails. There are three men waiting for him at the door, said Holmes. Ah, oh, right, indeed, you seem to have done the thing very completely. I must compliment you, and I you, Holmes answered. Your red-headed idea was quite new and effective. You'll see, uh, you'll see your pal presently again, said Jones. He's quicker at climbing down holes than I am. <clears throat> Right, I beg that you will touch me not with your filthy hands, rem 
remarked our prisoner as the handcuffs clattered upon his wrists. You may not be aware that I have royal blood in my veins. Have the goodness also, when you address me, always to say, sir, and please. All right, said Jones, with a stare and a small laugh. Well, would you please, sir, march upstairs where we can get a cab to carry your highness to the police station? That is better, said John Clay serenely. He made a sweeping bow to the three of us and walked quietly off in the custody of the detective. Really, Mr. Holmes, said Mr. Merriweather as we followed them from the cellar, I do not know how the bank can thank you or repay you. There is no doubt that you have detected and defeated, in the most complete manner, one of the most determined attempts at bank robbery that have ever come within my experience. I have had one or two little scores of my own to settle with Mr. John Clay, said Holmes. I've had... Uh, some small experience over this matter, which I shall expect the bank to refund. But, beyond that, I am amply repaid by having had an experience which is in many ways unique, and by hearing the very remarkable narrative of the Red-Headed League. You see, Watson, he explained, in the early hours of the morning as we sat over a glass of whiskey and soda in Baker Street. It was perfectly obvious from the first that only, that the only possible object of this rather fantastic business of the advertisement of the League and the copying of the encyclopedia must be to get this not overbright pawnbroker out of the way for a number of hours every day. It was a curious way of managing it, but, really, it would be difficult to suggest a better one. The method was no doubt suggested to Clay's ingenious mind by the color of his accomplice's hair. The four pounds a week was a lure which must draw him, and... What was such an amount to them, who were planning a heist for thousands? They put an advertisement in the paper. One rogue has the temporary office, the other rogue incites the man to apply for it, and together they manage to secure his absence every morning in the week. From the time I heard of the assistant having come for half wages, it was obvious to me that he had some strong motive for securing the situation. But how could you guess what the motive was? Had there been women in the house, I should have expected a mere vulgar intrigue. That, however, was out of the question. The pawnbroker's business is a small one and there was nothing in his house which could account for such elaborate preparations, and also such a large expense to pay the man for the pretense, as it were. It must then be something out of the house. What could it be? I thought of the assistant's fondness for photography, and his trick of vanishing into the cellar. The cellar. There was the end of this tangled clue. Then, I made inquiries as to this mysterious assistant, and I found that I had to deal with one of the coolest and most daring criminals in London. He was doing something in the cellar. Something which took many hours a day for months on end. What could it be? I could think of nothing, save that he was running a tunnel to some other building. So far had I got, 
When we went to visit the scene of action, I surprised you by beating upon the pavement with my stick. I was ascertaining whether the cellar stretched out in front or behind. It was not in front. Then I rang the bell, and, as I hoped, the assistant answered it. We have had some skirmishes, but we had never set eyes upon each other before. I hardly looked at his face. His knees were what I wished to see. You must... You must yourself have remarked how worn, wrinkled, and stained they were. They spoke of those hours of burrowing. The only remaining point was, what were they burrowing for? I walked around the corner, saw that the city and suburban bank abutted on our pawnbroker friend's premises, and felt that I had solved my problem. When you drove home after the concert, I called upon Scotland Yard, and also upon the chairman of the bank directors, with the result that you have seen. And how could you tell that they would make their attempt tonight, dear Holmes? I asked. Well, when they closed their league offices, that was a sign that they no longer cared about Mr. Jabez Wilson's presence. In other words, they had completed their tunnel, but it was essential that they should use it soon, as it might be discovered, or the bullion might be removed from the bank. Saturday would suit them better than any other day, because it would give them two days for their escape. For all these reasons, I expected them to come tonight. You reasoned it out beautifully, I exclaimed in unfeigned admiration. It is so long a chain, yet every link rings true. It has saved me from ennui, he answered, yawning. Alas, I already feel it closing in upon me. My life is spent in one long effort to escape from the commonplaces of existence. These little problems help me to do so. This poem caught by Sarah Teasdale. Um, Sarah Teasdale wrote this in 1920, and this is, this is one of her uh, best-known poems. Um, it's, it's, I guess it could be described to be about the resilience of the earth. It's um, nature cleaning up a field after a battle. And um, this poem... <clears throat> Instead of it being humans starting over, as in Morning Dew, this poem raises the idea that nature would not care at all if mankind were to become extinct. I've always said that regardless of things like global warming, climate change, pollution, the layer of plastic that we will geologically leave behind, If humanity goes extinct, the Earth eventually will be fine. It's less to say that we're killing the Earth and more to say that the biggest danger is the Earth is just really going to kind of shrug us off if we get too unruly and cause too much extinction, including our own. Um, kind of a, a, a heavy opener. I admit, but this poem inspired Ray Bradbury's short story of the same name. This poem is called There Will Come Soft Rains by Sarah Teasdale.
There will come soft rains, and the smell of the ground, and the swallows circling with their shimmering sound, and frogs in the pools singing at night, and wild plum trees in tremulous white. Robins will wear their feathery fire, whistling their whims on a low fence wire. And not one will know of the war. Not one will care at last when it's done. Not one would mind, neither bird nor tree, if mankind perished utterly. And spring herself, when she woke at dawn, would scarcely know that we were gone. Another one, another gem by O. Henry. This is the Chaparral Prince. Nine o'clock at last, and the drudging toil of the day was ended. Lena climbed to her room in the third half story of the Quarrymen's Hotel. Since daylight, she had slaved doing the work of a full-grown woman, scrubbing the floors, washing the heavy ironstone plates and cups, making the beds, supplying the insatiate demands for wood and water in that turbulent and depressing hostelry. The din of the day's quarry was over. The blasting and drilling, the creaking of the great cranes, the shouts of the foremen, the backing and shifting of the flat cars, hauling the heavy blocks of limestone. Down in the hotel office, three or four of the laborers were growling and swearing over a belated game of checkers. Heavy odors of stewed meat, hot grease, and cheap coffee hung like a depressing fog about the house and kind of gave me a bit of a stomach ache just reading about it. Lena lit the stump of a candle and sat limply upon her wooden chair. She was 11 years old, thin, and ill-nourished. Her back and limbs were sore and aching, but the ache in her heart made the biggest trouble. The last straw had been added to the burden upon her small shoulders. They had taken away Grimm. Always at night, however tired she might be, she had turned to Grimm for comfort and hope. Each time had Grimm whispered to her that the prince or the fairy would come and deliver her out of the wicked enchantment. Every night she had taken fresh courage and strength from Grimm. To whatever tale she read, she found an analogy in her own condition. The woodcutter's lost child, the unhappy goose girl, the persecuted stepdaughter, the little maiden imprisoned in the witch's hut. All these were but transparent disguises for Lena. The overworked kitchen maid in the quarryman's hotel. And always, when the extremity was direst, came the good fairy or the gallant prince to the rescue. So, here in the ogre's castle, enslaved by a wicked spell, Lena had leaned upon Grimm and waited, longing for the powers of goodness to prevail. But, on the previous day, Mrs. Maloney had found the book in her room and had carried it away, declaring sharply that it would not do for servants to read at night. They lost sleep and did not work briskly the next day. Can one only 11 years old, living away from one's mama and never having any time to play, live entirely deprived of Grimm? Just try it once. You'll see what a difficult thing it is. Lena's home was in Texas, away up among the little mountains on the pit, uh, on the Pedernales River, in a little town called Friedrichsburg. 
They're all German people who live in Friedrichsburg. Of evenings, they sit at little tables along the sidewalk and drink beer and play pinochle and scat, which is a trick-taking card game. They're very thrifty people. Thriftiest among them was Peter Heidesmuller, Lena's father. And that is why Lena was sent to work in the hotel at the quarries 30 miles away. She earned $3 every week there, and Peter added her wages to his well-guarded treasure. Peter had an ambition to become as rich as his neighbor, Hugo, Hugo Heffelbauer, who smoked a Meerschaum pipe three feet long and had Wiener Schnitzel and Hassenpfeffer for dinner every night in the week. And now, Lena was quite old enough to work and assist in the accumulation of riches. But, conjecture, if you can, what it means to be sentenced at 11 years of age from a home in the pleasant little Rhine village to hard labor in the ogre's castle where you must fly to serve the ogres while they devour cattle and sheep, growing, growling fiercely as they stamp white limestone dust from their great shoes for you to sweep and scour with your weak, aching fingers, and then to have Grimm taken away from you. Lena raised the lid of an old, empty case that had once contained canned corn, and got out a sheet of paper and a piece of pencil. She was going to write a letter to her mama. Tommy Ryan was going to post it for her at Bollinger's. Tommy was 17, worked in the quarries, went home to Bollinger's every night, and was now waiting in the shadows under Lena's window for her to throw the letter out to him. That was the only way she could send a letter to Friedrichsburg. Mrs. Maloney did not like for her to write letters. The stump of the candle was burning low. So, Lena hastily bit the wood from around the lead of her pencil and began. This is the letter she wrote. Dearest Mama, I want so much to see you, and Gretel, and Klaus, and Heinrich, and little Adolf. I'm so tired. I want to see you. Today I was slapped by Mrs. Maloney, and I had no supper. I could not bring in enough wood wood for my hand hurt, and she took my book yesterday. I mean, Grimm's fairy tales, which Uncle Leo gave me. It didn't hurt anyone for me to read the book. I try to work as well as I can, but there is so much to do. I read only a little bit every night. Dear Mama, I shall tell you what I'm going to do. Unless you send for me tomorrow to bring me home, I shall go to a deep place I know in the river and drown. It's wicked to drown, I suppose. But I wanted to see you and there is no one else. I'm very tired, and Tommy is waiting for the letter. You will excuse me, Mama, if I do it. Your respectful and loving daughter, Lena. Tommy was still waiting faithfully when the letter was concluded, and when Lena dropped it out, She saw him pick it up and start up the steep hillside. Without undressing, she blew out the candle and curled herself upon the mattress on the floor. At at 10.30 in the morning, old man Bollinger came out of his house and his... Back up. At 10.30 p.m., Old man Bollinger came out of his house in his stocking feet and leaned over the gate, smoking his pipe. 
He looked down the big road, white in the moonshine, and rubbed one ankle with the toe of his other foot. It was time for the Friedrichsburg mail to come pattering up the road. Old man Bollinger had waited only a few minutes when he heard the lively hoofbeats of Fritz's team of little black mules, and very soon afterward, his covered spring wagon stood in front of the gate. Fritz's big spectacles flashed in the moonlight, and his tremendous voice shouted a greeting to the postmaster of Bollinger's. The mail carrier jumped out and took the bridles from the mules, for he always fed them oats at Bollinger's. While the mules were eating from their feed bags, old man Bollinger brought out the mail sack and threw it into the wagon. Fritz Bergman was a man of three sentiments, or to be more accurate, four the pair of mules deserving to be reckoned individually. Those mules were the chief interest and joy of his existence. Next came the Emperor of Germany and Lena Hildesmuller. Tell me, said Fritz when he was ready to start, does the sack contain a letter to Frau Hildesmuller from the little Lena at the quarries? Uh, One man came uh, in the last mail to say that she is a little sick already. Her mama is very anxious to hear again. Yeah, said old man Bollinger. There's a letter from Miss Helter Skelter or some sitch name. Tommy Ryan brung it over when he came. Her little gal working over there, you say. It's her little gal, yeah? In the hotel shouted Fritz as he gathered up the lines. Eleven years old and not even as big as a Frankfurter. The close feast of a Peter Hildesmuller. Someday I shall with a big club pound that man's Dumkoff all in and out the town. Perhaps in this letter Nina will say that she is yet feeling better. So her mama will be glad. Auf Wiedersehen. Herr Ballinger, your feet will take cold out in the night air. So long, Fritzy, said old man Bollinger. You got a nice cool night for your drive. Up the road went the little black mules at their steady trot while Fritz thundered at them occasional words of endearment and cheer. These fancies occupied the mind of the mail carrier until he reached the big post oak forest, eight miles from the Bollingers. Here, his ruminations were scattered by the sudden flash and report of pistols and whooping as if a whole tribe of Indians. A band of galloping horsemen closed in around the mail wagon. One of them leaned over the front wheel, covered the driver with his revolver and ordered him to stop. Others caught at the bridles of Donder and Blitzen. Donder weiter, shouted Fritz with all his tremendous voice. Vasis, release your hands from those mules. We was the we, we, we was their United States mail. Hurry up, Dutch, drawled a melancholy voice. Don't you know when you're in a stick-up? Reverse your mules. Climb on out of the cart. And it's due to the breadth of Hondo Bill's demerit and the largeness of his achievements to state that the holding up of the Fredericksburg mail was not perpetrated by way of an exploit. As the lion while in the pursuit of prey commensurate to its prowess might set a frivolous foot upon a casual rabbit in its path. So Hondo Bill and his gang had swooped sportively upon the Pacific transport of Meinherr Fritz. The real work of their sinister night ride was over. 
Fritz and his mailbag and his mules came as gentle relaxation, grateful after the arduous duties of their profession. Twenty miles to the southeast stood a train with a killed engine, hysterical passengers, an eluded express and mail car. That represented the serious occupation of Hondo Bill and his gang. With a fairly rich prize of currency and silver, the robbers were making a wide detour to the west through the less populous country, intending to seek safety in Mexico by means of some formidable spot on the Rio Grande. The booty from the train had melted the desperate bushrangers to jovial and happy skylarkers. <laughs> Trembling with outraged dignity and no little personal apprehension, Fritz climbed out to the road after replacing his suddenly removed spectacles. The band had dismounted and were singing and capering and whooping, thus expressing their satisfied delight in the life of a jolly outlaw. Rattlesnake Rogers, who stood at the head of the mules, jerked a little too vigorously at the rein of the tender mouth donder who reared and emitted a loud, protesting snort of pain. Instantly, Fritz, with a scream of anger, flew at the bulky Rogers and began to assiduously pummel that surprised freebooter with his fists. Villain! shouted Fritz. Dog! Big stiff! That mule! She has a soreness by his mouth! I will knock off your shoulders mit your head, robber mans! Gee gee ha <laughs> ha howled Rattlesnake, roaring with laughter and ducking his head. Somebody get this here sour crowd off of me. One of the band yanked Fritz back by the coattail, and the woods rang with Rattlesnake's vociferous comments. <laughs> Doggone little wiener worst, he yelled amicably. <clears throat> Uh, he's, he's not so much of a skunk for a Dutchman. Took up for his Anna Mill. Plum quick, didn't he? I like to see a man like his horse. Even if his horse is a mule. The dad blamed little Limburger. He went for me, didn't he? <laughs> well, now, muley, I ain't a-going to hurt your mouth again anymore. Perhaps the mail would not have been tampered with had not been moody the lieutenant possessed certain wisdom that seemed to promise more spoils. Say, Cap, he said, addressing Hondo Bill, there's likely to be good pickings in these mail sacks. I've done some horse trading with these Dutchmen around Friedrichsburg, and I know the style of the varmints. There's big money goes through the mails of that town. Them Dutch risk a thousand dollars sent wrapped in a piece of paper before they'd pay the banks to handle the money. Hondo Bill, six foot two, gentle of voice and impulsive in action, was dragging the sacks from the rear of the wagon before Moody had finished his speech. A knife shone in his hand, and they heard the ripping sound as it bit through the tough canvas. The outlaws crowded around and began tearing open letters and packages, enlivening their labors and swearing affably at the writers who seemed to have conspired to confute the prediction of Ben Moody. Not a dollar was found in the Friedrichsburg mail. You ought to be ashamed of yourself, said Hondo Bill to the mail carrier in solemn tones, to be Packing round such a lot of old trashy paper as this. What'd you mean by it anyhow? Where you Dutchers keep your money at? The Bollinger mail sack opened like a cocoon under Hondo's knife. It contained but a small handful of mail. Fritz Fritz had been fuming with terror and excitement until this sack was reached. He now remembered Lena's letter. He addressed the leader of the band, asking that that particular missive be spared. Much obliged, Dutch, 
he said to the disturbed courier. I guess that's the letter we want. Got spondu lux in it, ain't it? Ah, here she is. Make a light, boys. Hondo found and tore open the letter to Mrs. Heidel's Mueller. The others stood about, lighting twisted up letters from one another. Hondo gazed with mute disapproval at the single sheet of paper covered with the angular German script. Whatever is this you humbuckered us with, Dutchie? You call this here a valuable letter? That's a mighty low-down trick to play on your friends what come along to help you distribute your mail. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, no, no, that's, that's, that's Chinese writing, said Sandy Gundry, peering over Hondo's shoulder. Ah, yeah, rough, you yeah, kazip, declared another of the gang, an effective youth, covered with silk handkerchiefs and nickel plating. That's shorthand. I seen him do it in court once. Ach, ach, no, 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 that is German, said Fritz. It is no more as a little girl writing a letter to her mama. One poor little girl, sick and working hard away from home. Ach, it is a shame. Good Mr. Robber Man, you will please let me have that letter. What the devil you take us for, old pretzels? said Hondo with sudden and surprising severity. You ain't presuming to insinuate that we gents ain't possessed a sufficient politeness for to take an interest in the missus' health now, is you? Now, you go on, and you read that scratching out loud and in plain United States language to this here company of educated society. Hondo twirled his six-shooter by its trigger guard and stood towering above the little German, who at once began to read the letter, translating the simple words into English. The gang of rovers stood in absolute silence, listening intently. How old is that kid? asked Hondo when the letter was done. Eleven, said Fritz. Where's she at? At those rock quarries, working. Ach, my God, little Lena, she speak of drowning. I do not know if she will do it, but if she shall, I swear I will do that Peter Hildesmuller shoot mit a gun. You Dutchers, said Hondo Bill, his voice swelling with fine contempt. Y'all make me pretty tired, hiring out your kids to work when they ought to be playing dolls in the sand. You're a hell of a sect of people. I reckon we'll fix your clock for a while just to show you what you think of your old cheesy nation. Here, boys! Hondo Bill parlayed aside briefly with his band, and then they seized Fritz and conveyed him off the road to one side. Here they bound him fast to a tree with a couple of lariats. His team, his mules, they tied to another tree nearby. We ain't gonna hurt you bad, said Hondo reassuringly. It won't hurt you to be tied up for a while. We will now pass you the time of day as it is up to us to depart. Now, Dutchy, don't get yourself riled up with no more impatience, huh? Fritz heard a great squeaking of saddles as the men mounted their horses, then a loud yell and a great clatter of hooves as they galloped pell-mell back along the Friedrichsburg Road. For more than two hours, Fritz sat against the tree, tightly but not painfully bound. Then, from the reaction after his exciting adventure, he sank into slumber. How long he slept he knew not, but he was at last awakened by a rough shake. Hands were untying his ropes. He was lifted to his feet, dazed, confused in mind, and weary of body. Rubbing his eyes, he looked 
and saw that he was again in the midst of the same band of terrible bandits. They shoved him up to the seat of his wagon and they placed the lines in his hands. Hit it out for home, Dutch, said Hondo Bill's voice commandingly. You've given us lots of trouble and we're pleased to see the back of your neck. Spiel! Zwe bear! Vamoose! Hondo reached out and gave Blitzen a smart crack with his riding crop. The three, the little mules, the little mules sprang ahead, glad to be moving again. Fritz urged them along, himself dizzy and muddled over his fearful adventure. According to schedule time, he should have reached Friedrichsburg at daylight. As it was, he drove down the long street of the, the town at 11 o'clock a.m., he had to pass Peter Heidelsmuller's house on his way to the post office. He stopped his team at the gate and called, but Frau Hildesmuller was watching for him. Out rushed the whole family of Hildesmullers. Frau Hildesmuller, fat and flushed, inquired if he had a letter from Lena. And then Fritz raised his voice and told the tale of his adventure. He told of the contents of that letter that the robber had made him read. And then Frau Hildesmuller broke into wild weeping. Her little Lena drowned herself. Why had they sent her from home? What could be done? Perhaps it would be too late by the time they could send for her now. Peter, Peter Hildesmuller, dropped his long meerschaum pipe on the walk and it shivered into pieces. Woman! He roared at his wife. Why did you let that child go away? It is your fault if she comes home to us no more. Everyone knew that it was Peter Hildesmuller's fault, so they paid no attention to those particular words. A moment afterward, a strange, faint voice was, here to call, was heard to call, Mama! Frau Hildesmuller at first thought it was Lena's spirit calling, and then she rushed to the rear of Fritz's covered wagon and with a loud shriek of joy caught up Lena herself, covering her pale little face with kisses and smothering her with hugs. Lena's eyes were heavy with the deep slumber of exhaustion, but she smiled and lay close to the one she had longed to see. There among the mail sacks, Covered in a nest of strange blankets and comforters, she had lain asleep until wakened by the voices around her. Fritz stared at her with eyes that bulged behind his spectacles. Gott in Himmel, he shouted. How did you get in that wagon? I am uh, going crazy as well, too, as to be murdered and hanged by robbers this day. You brought her to us, Fritz, cried Frau Hildesmuller. How can we ever thank you enough? Tell Mama how you came in Fritz's wagon, said Frau Hildesmuller. I, 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 I don't, I don't know, said Lena. But I know how I got away from the hotel. The prince brought me. By the emperor's crown, shouted Fritz. We are all going crazy. I always knew he would come said Lena, sitting down on her bundle of bedclothes on the sidewalk. Last night, he came with his armed knights and captured the ogre's castle. They broke the dishes and kicked down the doors. They pitched Mr. Maloney into a barrel of rainwater and threw flour all over Mrs. Maloney. The workmen in the hotel jumped out of the windows and ran into the woods when the knights began firing their guns. They wakened me up and I... And I peeped down the stair, and then the prince, the prince came up and wrapped me in the bedclothes, and he carried me out. He was so tall and strong and fine, his face was as rough as a scrubbing brush, but he talked soft and kind and smelled of schnapps. He, he took me on his horse before him, and we rode away among the knights. He held me close. And I went to sleep that way, and didn't wake up till I got home. Rubbish! cried Fritz Bergman. Fairy tales! How did you come from the quarries to my wagon? 
The prince brought me, said Lena confidently. And to this day, the good people of Friedrichsburg haven't been able to make her give any other explanation. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Fireside Tales with Wolfgang. To view more of my work, check out my YouTube channel at Hunter's Acoustic Cabin. Directed by Hunter Ackerman. Endorsed by Wolfgang Beastly. Produced by GWC Productions. Originally broadcast on GWC Productions' YouTube channel, CAPS Media Television Channel 6, KPPQ LP Ventura at 104.1 FM, and on the KPPQ Podcast Network.